Welcome to our first ever virtual grower meeting at Market Lit Seeds. We had our first ever virtual dairy meeting last week, which went very well. And so thanks for joining us today. Um, we know that this is a little unconventional, but we thought we'd take the time to connect, uh, I guess, before spring um, with some hard hitting topics and also see if you have any questions. We have a good lineup of speakers today. On the call today, we have uh, everyone from Mark Hutlet Seeds, so myself, Karis, uh, we have Ben and Mark. We also have a bit of a schedule. So Michael Weir is the area agronomist joining us from Pioneer. He's gonna talk about the P7574 AM corn and new canola products. We have Robert Hornford from Univar joining us to go over in Vita, which is brand new as well with in and foliar options. Kaylin Shearer is the crop protection uh, specialist from Corteva and so she has a little list of things that are really key for our area in terms of uh, crops and uh, weeds. After that, we do have some prize draws, some pretty exciting prizes today. Mark, let me use the credit card. So we have some portable uh, propane barbecue. Oh, we have one. We have one pro portable propane barbecue to give away, as well as some pickup days prize packs. So lots of market changes. Uh, some pretty good things happening out there, I guess. We've seen a lot of changes, so I wanted you to, uh, wanted to update you with some seed supply. The Pioneer grain corn is in great supply. Uh, we don't see any issues there. Select Pioneer corn silage hybrids are in good supply, but some of those later CRM products are getting uh, sold out. So if you do think you're going to expand some silage acres, uh, let us know. We'll find the best fit for your farm. Um, most Pioneer soybean varieties are in good supply. Some are approaching the limits, though. So just uh, keep that in mind. And then North Star Seeds and Pioneer Alfalfa, uh, all forages are in really good shape. So um, with that, I'm just gonna pass this to Ben to go over our trial program as well as our yield challenge winners. Sure, yeah, so once again, we're, we're hoping to launch a really good trial year. Uh, trials are very important to us for a number of reasons. Um, the first and foremost is that we want to have that commitment to local and transparent data. We don't just want to show up in fall and, and tell you guys that we have the best seed and you should buy it. We want to make sure that, that we have a good understanding of the products and that you have a comfort with those products as well. So especially as we launch these new products, we want to get them out there to as many locations as possible, as many different soil types, growing conditions, um, and just kind of see what, what those genetics do in different areas and uh, probably what, what is ultimately going to be the best fit on your particular farm. So that's, that's one thing that we try to do as much as possible every year, get those trials out there, um, watch them throughout the season. It gives us a reason to come out there after planting, mid season, towards the end, and just get a really good handle on, on what those products are going to do and what the best seed is for, for your acres in a following year. Um, so once again, we're inviting everyone who's, who's willing to do so to put in a plot it can be a genetic plot where we plant multiple hybrids or varieties side by side um, or a, an agronomic plot. So if there's some new products that you're interested in, um, leave a test strip. We'd love to come and flag that, walk it with you and uh, ultimately weigh it at harvest time um, to see again what, what these products are doing. Do they live up to the claims um, that are being put out there? As always, we're running our yield challenge again this year. So that's 20 acres of free seed for the 2022 season um, for anyone that uh, achieves the, the predetermined yields. So that's always an exciting thing um, that's offered through Pioneer. Uh, there's also the Yield Hero Contest. Uh, there's some grand prizes. Last year, unfortunately, we were not able to award any, any trips anywhere for obvious reasons, um, but there were some, uh, some credit cards, I think, that were, were sent out to some growers or are being sent out. Um, and then there's, there's some smaller prizes as well. The other thing that this allows us to do at Harvest is to kind of get some publicity. It gives you an opportunity to see kind of what, what some of the other growers are achieving in the area. Um, and again, it gives us a bit of a, a contact point, which um, we're certainly missing um, more of this year. Uh, so all of the uh, customers that did uh, plots last year that we went out and weighed, uh, we've got a couple boxes of these fantastic ratchet straps that are branded with the Pioneer Yield Hero um, promotional uh, image. So um, that's exciting. We're going to bring those out with, with the seed again this spring. So just, uh, I guess, a congratulations um, from last year. I know it was a very dry year. 
Uh, we did not have any, any canola winners, but that's certainly something that we're looking for as well. If you guys are interested in putting in a side-by-side, -side, um, we will supply that seed for you. And um, yeah, we, we'd love to have a few more competitors on that side of things. For grain corn last year, we had to achieve a minimum of 165 bushels per acre, and we had uh, five winners. So we had Kurt Neufeld out of that Turand area. Sheldon Harms was in, in God's Country in Grenthal. Uh, Hennervik Farms and MPW were both uh, kind of down towards the same Mallow area, and Morin Seeds out of Otterburn. So congratulations to all of those growers for some fantastic yields last year, despite the drier conditions. And then on the soybean side, it's 45 bushels per acre. And we had a number of winners. They included Emily's Crops, which was close to Linden, Lacteria Holsteins in the La Brokery area, Sheldon Harms again down by Grenthal, Scott Goosen, very close to our office here by Dufresne, uh, and then St. Ray Farms and SRH Farms also in that uh, La Brokery, um, St. Raymond area. So congratulations again. And again, this is another invite to you. If you're interested in seeing what different varieties are gonna do for you this year, um, let's try to get a, a plan going and uh, we'll come out and help plant those plots if we need to, flag them and keep a good eye on them as the season progresses. Now we'll hear from Mike. Uh, Michael is the area agronomist with Pioneer and he's gonna cover some new grain corn and canola products. Okay, perfect. Well, again, thanks Karis and Mark Cutlet Seeds for having me on. Today's gonna be a little bit different from my perspective. It's, it's more of a, a, a very high level product update. So one particular new grain corn hybrid that we've advanced from our impact program um, that I'll go through. And then, and then switching gears on canola and, and in particularly our Liberty Link uh, segment. So some of the offerings we have there um, and how to, how to, you know, the benefits of, of going to a, a pioneer Liberty Link uh, platform and some of the, the protector traits that we have to um, that fit really well in, in the growing environment that we have in the Red River Valley and some of the risks that we start to see creeping in. So the first thing I'll focus on is, is uh, a new product we advanced from Impact this, this past year. So we tested this one uh, pre-commercial for two years at a number of impacts across Manitoba, across Western Canada, really. Um, and with that, we advanced this into a commercial name called P7574. So the exciting part about 7574, uh, as far as performance observations, so these are comments from, from what I've seen in the field at the impact locations that we've tested this product, is, is a few different things as far as agronomics that it, it uh, provides uh, for the growing environment we're, we're growing in, in uh, Western Canada. So one thing in particular is, is really this product stood out above all for standout early season emergence. So you could stand at the front of the impact locations and uh, look across and really pick out this product at emergence. So anywhere from that, that V1 up to V4, you could really see this one stretch its legs and take off out of the gate, which, which is very important for us in, in Western Canada. Generally, we're putting our corn in as, as early as possible, quite often a little bit more challenging conditions, cooler ground, um, sh short and growing seasons. So the importance of having a product that can, that can jump out of the gates early is, is quite critical. And this one definitely uh, stands out above, you know, a lot of the commercial products that we currently have, as well as the competitors that we're testing against in those locations. The other thing that I noted is, is how tough this one is as far as consistency across environments. So obviously we have, we have corn hybrids that'll take advantage of ideal um, scenarios, soil types, moisture conditions, and, and really stretch its legs and, and perform well from a yield perspective. And then we have, we have products that can um, you know, withstand that yield potential across some challenging environments. So if we do run into those cooler grounds in the spring, uh, sometimes we get waterlogged soil, which hasn't been as much of an issue the last couple of years. Um, we, we run into tighter clays. So if you're on more of a clay-based soil, sometimes getting the crop off to a good start is a bit more of a challenge where this one will help uh, mitigate some of that risk. Um, just overall, when you look at the data across the locations over two years, it's just been a consistent performer across all soil types, across all different types of stressful or ideal conditions that we've, we've tested in. The other thing that we've, we've seen trend in the last couple of years is, is uh, the importance of test weight with local markets that are available for, in particularly in your 
in your uh, your area or the, or the folks on the on the call this morning um, going towards uh, local feed mills um, you know test weight becomes a pretty critical thing as far as quality of that that product that you're trying to sell so um, when we look at our current lineup and then we we fit 75 74 into that lineup we see we see a uh, an increase or um, a jump in our yield or sorry our test weight potential is 75 74 so in comparison to say something like 75 27 where we've seen around that 53 to 54 pound test weight um, in some instances we've seen it dip a little bit lower in some some more challenging conditions this one maintains its test weight to more of that that more marketable number that you're looking for so we we see over 75 27 over 78 61 we see a one to two pound increase from the data that we've collected at our impact locations so it is a bit more of a flintier looking corn hybrid earlier flower more time to pack in that starch um, and with that you maintain a, a better test weight um, come maturity and then finally uh, you know, maybe not so much for, for the silage folks on the call, if there is any, but uh, we see this one as we move west into Saskatchewan, western Manitoba, and then as far west as Alberta, this being a really good fit for silage. Uh, very good silage characteristics. It is a tall grain hybrid. Um, and then also, as well as the, 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 the grain component to it, which really packs on that starch or energy. So it's, it's, it's a really good, um, you know, a dual purpose product that we talk about um, going to be a really good fit for, for a lot of different instances across Western Canada. Um, overall, the agronomics characteristics look good, uh, good stocks, good roots. Um, Goss is, is, I would say, average. Um, it's good enough for the, a lot of the stresses that, or a lot of the, the pressures that we see with Goss in the Red River Valley. So just all in all, just a, just a stable um, durable product that we've, we've uh, positioned within our lineup now. So it'll position well with 7527 and probably um, fit a little bit better across uh, some more challenging conditions that you might have on your farm where you're, you're growing corn this year. So this is what it looks like out in the field. It, it, it looks like corn. <laughs> um, but what I'm trying to show here is just the, the emergence bigger of this product compared to some of the other products that I mentioned earlier. So you know, stretches its legs really good out, out of the gate. Um, next to 75 or 78, 7958, pardon me, um, which is another very aggressive hybrid we have in our lineup. And it's it's keeping right up with, with 7958. Um, you know, late season plant health as far as stock integrity, a little bit better stay green with that, I guess, a slightly flintier um, genetics. We see it hold together a little bit better where in the past we've seen not too much of a concern as far as tops tipping over it, but just holds up a bit better if we do run into some weather issues come fall time. Mike, uh, yeah. that's that's the million dollar picture, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll maybe forward that to you, Kara, so you can put it on your website. Yeah, so we see this uh, 7527. It's uh, one of our top sellers. We do see when it's when it's uh, packing in that starch in the fall, it sucks itself dry. And sometimes you see those tops kink over. We're 75, 74, um, it holds together a little bit stronger come fall time, if that is a concern of yours. And then I don't wanna go through too much of the data, just highlighted a couple of the key commercial products we have in our lineup and how it compares. So 74, 17, similar maturity, we're seeing a yield bump on there, and again, a slight test weight advantage. 7527 parity yield, which, which says a lot. 7527 has great yield potential. We're seeing a slight moisture advantage, and again, that, that test weight advantage that we see with 7574. And then 7861 had a good year this year. Um, as far as yield performance, it is a little bit later, so it takes advantage of that. Uh, so it was a little bit um, lower as far as yield goes significantly drier though and then again a test weight advantage over 7861. Um, against a uh, competitor in our impacts 2989 to um, you know across 13 locations that we've tested we've seen yield advantage, moisture advantage, test weight advantage. So uh, again just summarize um, you know a great fit complements our, our uh, early to mid uh, grain market. Um, with a lot of the, the end use, end use uh, folks like feed mills that'll, that'll fit well. 
And then quickly on silage, this is from uh, locations, Alberta, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ontario, but a lot of the data for 75, 74 would probably be more of Northern states and in, in Alberta, where we're seeing 75, 74 actually come in at the top of the charts for silage yield and uh, quality compared to even some products as late as, uh, you know, we have 87 CRM products in here. So great dual purpose product. Okay, so uh, switching gears here and, and talking a bit more on, on canola, something we haven't talked too much about um, at a lot of Mark Hutlet Seeds meetings, but um, you know, in the last couple of years, we've introduced some products in the Liberty uh, traded segment, uh, P501 being the first one that we've come to market with. And uh, you know, when we came to market with this product, we did see quite a shift aggressively into that straight cut market, um, where 501, again, didn't have the pod shatter um, rating that we we really would like to see for a straight cut product. So there, you did take on a bit of risk if you decided to straight cut P501, but the yield potential on it is fantastic, and it's it continues to perform and be consistent across uh, across Western Canada, but in particularly in in Manitoba and the Red River Valley, 501 has performed very well. So there, you still have some great options for if you if you do want to have a product you can swap. 501 is um, a great option there. And of course, with that club root trait, uh, uh, great fit. But with that switch to, to straight cut or wanting to late swath straight cut, we did we have advanced two new products in the Liberty segment. Um, very small amounts last year and trialing purposes. We did learn a little bit more about them, um, but having more supply this year as we really start to test these products across a larger area. So the first one I'll talk to, P506 ML. Um, so the things that I like about this product is, again, the club root traits that are becoming more and more important for us in Manitoba, and I'll get into that in a second. Um, and then, of, of course, the, the yield potential on it, too. So in our, in our impacts or um, impact small plot tests that we've, we've seen the last couple of years, we see parity to slightly improve yield potential over 501. And then we also see uh, an increase or a, an improvement as far as the pod shatter. Um, um, rating on on 506 compared to 501. With 506, I wouldn't say uh, you know com being completely transparent. I, I wouldn't say we're, we close the gap completely on on the competitors' um, pod shatter product, but we are getting closer with 506. So you, it is a great fit for for, for a, a late swath, um, or if if uh, if things look good, you have a good stand, you have a healthy crop. Um, good moisture, um, you know, this is definitely a product that you can straight cut under the right, right conditions. Um, and we do have we do have a little bit of supply left, 506, so if you are interested in trying some, for sure, just let uh, Ben Karras from Mark know. Uh, but overall, just solid agronomic package, great seed treatment options, um, covers you as far as black leg, club root, and then having that um, the risk management as far as uh, the harvest max trait that it offers. The other one we have that we're launching this year that's a little bit more limited, but P505 MSL. And this, this is a product, there really is no other like it in the market. Uh, P505, again, Liberty Link tolerance. Um, comparable yield to slightly better from what we saw last year compared to 501, 506. Um, and, and the other thing that this thing offers again is club root protector traits and then it has harvest max as well and with this one i from what i've seen it's an improvement over and above 506 so again we've gone from 501 to slightly improving hard harvest max to 506 and then i think we've made another step forward with 505 as far as that harvest max uh, pod shatter rating so i think with 505 we have closed the gap with some of the competitors products in that club group pod shatter segment. So um, for example, BSF's 300 series, from what we saw last year under some drier conditions, this P505 MSL is, has uh, held up comparable to those, those products from the competitor. And then finally, the other thing that you don't hear a lot of is, is sclerotinia protector trait. So Corteva really is the only company that's working with this, this type of technology. Um, where again, we're making inroads and making further steps towards, you know, potential fungicide replacement for sclerotinia. We're not there yet. What this provides is a bit of a risk management tool. If you're in a, in a higher pressure year for sclerotinia, 
where in some cases, if you have a good crop, some folks in the past have sprayed their canola twice with fungicide for sclerotinia, or a product like 505, you, you would get away with only spraying once. Or if you're in kind of a, a medium, moderate risk for sclerotinia pressure, 505, um, you know, the background genetics within that product should be able to withstand that pressure. So again, two really good products as we step into that a little bit further in that Liberty Link market. And again, uh, you know, closing the gap to a product like 505 where we have closed the gap as far as pod shatter, um, Harvest Max technology in that Liberty market. So just to close, I wanted to talk about a few other things. Just there's been a, there's been a big shift to, to straight cutting canola and a lot of focus on and, and rightly so, we, 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 all, we focus often on the last thing we've experienced within growing our crop, and that's harvest. Um, so there is a lot of focus on straight cutting and pod shatter, but we can't forget about some of the other things that are important as far as risk management within your canola crop. So the big ones that I, I noticed over the last couple of years is flea beetle pressure. Um, and then just the, the amount of testing that we've increased it is increased with canola on, on club root distribution. So if you look on this screen here on the left side, I know it's quite small, but this, this is a breakout of the RMs with Man within Manitoba. Um, and just distribution of what the spore loads are with club root um, across the province. So oddly enough, uh, you know, in my mind, I always thought maybe we would have seen more colorful map further west where there's a tighter rotation of canola that's grown. Um, but it's surprising to see as we get in into the central part of the province and even into eastern Manitoba and the Red River Valley, the map's actually a little bit more colorful than what we see in western Manitoba. So I don't want to ring the alarm bell here, but I just want people to note that, you know, we do have club root within, within eastern Manitoba. Um, <clears throat> we, we do have a risk of developing club root on your farm if you are growing products without club root traits or if, you're, if you have a tighter rotation of canola. Um, a great risk management tool to keeping these spore loads down so you don't develop a problem where you start to see galls forming in your field is obviously crop rotation, but a big part is growing um, canola with, with club root traits. Anything we can do to limit the propagation of these spores when you're growing canola uh, just limits the impact that you, that you uh, develop club root within your farm. So again, don't want to raise too many, many alarm bells. I just want people to realize that club root is a reality and it's something we have to take seriously within, within even Eastern Manitoba. Um, these, these colors within these RMs, really what they, they uh, exemplify is there's potentially one or two or, or just a select few fields within these RMs that have been tested to show these certain numbers of spores of club root within the sample. So not actual visual goals unless you're in the red, um, but just spore loads that, that have been observed in a soil test that's, that's been taken in those RMs in a particular field. The other thing too I wanted to focus on is just the flea beetle pressure we've seen the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, things that I've noted, but also heard a lot of comments from growers, just the benefit of having Helix vibrance um, compared to a competitive offering like Prosper um, for flea beetle control um, and durability under those higher pressures of of uh, striped or crucifer flea beetles. And then on top of that, throwing Lumiderm into the mix too to increase that flea beetle control and then protect you against cutworm. Um, I talked about corn, the importance of getting it off to the races in the shortened season we have. You know, canola too, it's it's a peace of mind knowing that with, with Pioneer bag of canola, you have helix vibrance. And then of course, if you want, you can add Lumiderm to there to, to mitigate the risk of seeing um, you know, those higher pressures of flea beetles really slow you down in the spring. We do, we do have uh, obviously some fields that do get sprayed for flea beetles under higher pressure, but just when you, when you note side by sides where you can see these differences in, in the control of flea beetles of our offering versus the competitor, it's, it, it uh, picture paints a thousand words. So again, just wanted to focus on some of the other things that you need to keep in mind when we're, when we're choosing our our canola products. So again, Pioneer is in the game with, with uh, Liberty Link Canola. We have industry-leading club root traits to help manage some of this risk that we see on this map. 
We have industry leading seed treatments on the canola seed that helps with some of this pressure that we see in the spring. And we have a number of different trait segments too. So I spoke to Liberty. Uh, we have we have lots of Roundup products. And then of course, Clearfield, if that's an option for you, um, there's some premiums that can be taken advantage there uh, with Clearfield products where we do see some of those pioneer traits I mentioned earlier, such as Harvest Max. And there you have it, Karis. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I just have a quick poll here for our guests or our attendees. Um, this is for the 75, 74 a.m. This is going to be a big part of our trials in 2021. We do have some limited bags. And so uh, we're wondering uh, who, who would be interested in, in putting that in for a trial. Uh, the results here will be kept uh, internally and then we'll contact you and follow up uh, later. So we'll let, let this run for a few seconds or a minute or so. Uh, next, we have Robert uh, to talk about NVIDIA. So Robert, you can share your screen. Good morning. Can you just let me know that my audio is good and the slides are visible? We can see you and we can hear you. Perfect. Well, I'm glad I could be here. It sure looks like uh, spring is starting to arrive this week. So getting excited to get out in the field and get away from my desk. Uh, I'm Robert Hornford. I'm the Director of Agronomy for Univar Solutions Nexus Biowag based out of Winnipeg. And today I'd like to talk very quickly about a product called Invita. So Invita is a brand new technology to Canada. It was registered last season, uh, too late for commercial use. So this will be the first year of commercial use, but it has been used in the US for a few years as well as in the EU. So if you've been using that great agronomist called Google and searching for products like this, you've been able to learn a little bit about the product. So I'm going to take you through what it's set up for in Canada this year. But you'll find a lot more information about the product in the great big world of the web. So Invita is a natural bacteria that was originally isolated from sugarcane that brings nitrogen fixation to a wide range of crops. Uh, not only legumes, but also corn, wheat, canola, flax, barley. It's very non-specific in what crops can host it. In Canada, the registration is for all the major field crops and the major row crops. So corn and soybeans, plus wheat, barley, oats, canola, durum, etc. In Canada, it does not yet have a registration on horticultural, turf, or specialty crops that you'll see in other countries. So what it does is it actually penetrates the plant and it fixes nitrogen within the plant. And it works in both the roots, uh, the shoots and the leaves, the entire uh, process of the, the entire portions of the plant. And we do have limited amounts available in 2021, both for trialing and commercial field use. This is what the product looks like. It's a liquid, it's an inoculant. So you have to treat it like an inoculant, don't let it freeze. It's a brown colored uh, liquid. There are four jugs in a case. Each of those jugs does 40 acres. And when you look at the label, you'll see there's a range of uh, applications and a range of rates. What we've done for this year to make it simple for growers in a launch year is standardize all crops, all application types at that 40 acres to the case rate. So all you have in that jug is the water carrier, uh, the bacterium, and some polysaccharides, which are the food source. The way we're positioning this in the marketplace is it should be used to supplement or augment your fertility plan. We want growers to maintain the normal fertility plan and not use this technology to replace or cut back on their nitrogen. We want to set growers up for success and the best ROI based on the commercial use in other countries has been used this to has been using this to top up your nitrogen supply. And why that is important is you can have enough nitrogen in the in the field in your initial plan but you can lose it for any reason uh, leaching volatilization. You can also have a crop that growth potential exceeds what you place down and what the soil and fertilizer reserves are available in terms of nitrogen for that crop. Or you can have periods when the crop is in its peak demand for nitrogen and you're not able to supply it either by the rhizobium in a legume crop or by the soil reserves and fertilizer bank from a uh, non-legume crop. But what Invita does is it penetrates the plant 
and it starts to fix nitrogen as soon as it's in the plant and it continues to do so until the plant starts to go into maturity and dry down because once it hits maturity stage it's no longer providing the carbohydrates or the energy source to the bacterium. So I like to talk about in vita versus rhizobium because we're all familiar with the rhizobium, uh, what it does, what its value is. In many ways, they're very similar and in many ways, they're very different. So they're both bacterium. They're very, very distantly related, but they both, both take inert nitrogen from the atmosphere and exchange for sugars or carbohydrates from the plant with which they form a symbiotic relationship. They use that plant source of food to convert some of that uh, atmospheric nitrogen into a plant available form. And in case of Invita, on average across all crops, it releases 54% of the nitrogen it fixes as available for plant growth. It needs that other 46% for its own growth development and colonization of the plant. So like, like uh, rhizobium, uh, it's a bacterium, forms a symbiotic relationship. Uh, it, doesn't, uh, it does not, unlike a rhizobium, uh, cause uh, lazy beans. So if you use uh, too much nitrogen, obviously the rhizobium is going to have a not be as effective or as productive. If you use Invita on top of rhizobium, for example, in a legume, you don't have that uh, experience. It does not, it works compatible, compatibly with the rhizobium. It doesn't have a, a lazy bean effect. So beans are gonna be of any kind, they're gonna have a specific rhizobium. So rhizobium is limited to legume. You've got one strain for your soybeans. You've got a different strain for your peas and lentils. You've got a different strain for your dry peas. It also does not form nodules. So a rhizobium is gonna be limited below the soil. It's gonna to have to form a nodule, fix the nitrogen within the nodule. And there's a delay in getting that process and that structure built. Invita can penetrate the plant directly through the roots and through the foliage, which means it can be applied in soil like a rhizobium would be, but can also be applied foliar directly to the leaves. In addition, without that drag or delay in time and needing to form a nodule, the Invita actually starts its nitrogen fixation process in a legume, for example, quicker. It will not fix as much nitrogen as a rhizobium in a legume. So that's why it would not replace, but only add to the rhizobium. So when we talk about advantages of Invita, the, obviously the advantage is it's bringing nitrogen fixation as a biofertilizer. But the little icon of the bin is because it increases yield capture. The three little plants icon with early establishment has two components to it. One is earlier establishment, earlier growth, more green matter, more bio, uh, uh, more green matter, more biomass, more leaf area index. The multi-crop icon is there to represent the wide range of crops that can go on. The increased N symbol is for increased nitrogen fixation. And then the ends throughout the entire plant mean that it's active both in the above ground and below ground. It's not limited to a nodule or below ground. And that's just to illustrate what the benefits and what you would expect from the product. So how do you apply the product? If you look at the label on the CFI website, there are three application windows, in furrow, foliar, and seed. We are only supporting this year the in furrow application and the foliar application. We're not uh, promoting the seed because the liquid formulation, it's very high in uh, volume and it make for uh, wet seed lots. We don't want to go down that route. There are new formulations being developed and field tested right now uh, where we can get plots in the ground uh, looking at seed treatment specific formulations. But it can go in furrow and we're focusing on any crop, but our primary focuses are corn and soybeans, 40 acres to the jug. It requires two and a half gallons of uh, water in addition to any startup or pop-up fertilizer you've got. So if you're going with a liquid kit, you can put it in with your startup and pop-up fertilizers. And I'll talk a bit about that in a moment, but you do require an additional two and a half gallons of water per acre. And when you go foliar, we're focusing on corn and soybeans, but also canola, wheat, and other crops in that order. It can go anywhere from herbicide timing up to flag leaf timing in cereals. It can go with uh, foliar fertilizers, 
or pesticides, be they insecticides, fungicides, or herbicides. And again, the rate is 95 mils per acre, which works out to 40 acres to the jug. So just a slide on each of the application windows. So within furrow, the important thing is to have good placement in relation to the seed in the seed row. You don't want to be placing this product down in a way. You don't want to be banding it. You want it in close proximity as possible to the seed row. And when you're mixing it, we want it to be uh, mixed so that it does not go directly into the startup or pop-up fertilizer, just to be gentle on the biological. So we're recommending that you follow either the fertilizer or starter in the tank, followed by that two and a half gallons of water per acre, followed by the Invita, the biological, or vice versa, put the Invita in first, then the water, and then the starter. So that way you're not putting the bug directly into the undiluted fertilizer. It should be applied in the day that uh, you do the mixing. And the only fertilizers that we recommend you do not use in a startup situation are urea, and those that contain zinc, because those two have been known to be hard on the overall efficacy of the bug. When we get to a foliar application, you should treat it like a contact herbicide. That means it's all about coverage and contact. So 10 gallons or more of water per acre is the recommendation. It takes three to four hours for it to penetrate the cuticle. It has hydrolytic enzymes that allow it to move directly into the plant. So because of that, it's got a six hour rain fastness. And then there's the practical things about the application because you have to keep that spray droplet on the leaf surface moist enough for that three to four hours for the penetration to occur. So we recommend applications in the morning or the evening, applications when you're not going to be in the midst of the afternoon with a hot, dry, uh, desiccating time of day when those spray droplets are going to dry before you've had time for penetration, or to avoid a day when you know you're going to be windy after spray application has occurred because you never spray during the wind, of course, because you don't want those spray droplets to dry on the foliage and not allow sufficient time for penetration. Again, uh, mix it up on the day that you're going to apply it. And it's very forgiving in terms of water. Uh, you can even use treated municipal water for the application. But again, you're not letting it sit overnight in the tank. It should go down on the day of application. And the only herbicides that we advise that you not mix with are those that contain 2,4-D or MCPA. Because again, like urea and zinc, those two have been demonstrated to be hard on the efficacy of the bug. So when you walk into a field as an agronomist, what are the three things you're gonna look for? You're gonna look for early establishment, you're gonna look for advanced growth, and you're gonna look for yield at the end of the day. I'll mention advanced growth. So based on corn commercial use in the US, in vita treated corn moves to the dead stage five to seven days earlier than untreated corn. That's the commercial experience in the US. How that translates into Canada, our conditions and our varieties, we can't say until we get commercial use and adoption or how it translates into our crops, we can't also say, but it's been positive in terms of that experience in the US. Just a shot of uh, foliar applied uh, to soybeans at the V3 stage on the left and inferro applied to corn on the right. So if we start with corn, this is what I talk about in terms of early emergence. You can see it on the far right, the corn with the Invita and the fertilizer. Then as you move to the left, the Invita alone, then the fertilizer alone, and then the check. And that's just the difference in green biomass and leaf area index production. Because as soon as that plant is up and growing, uh, the chlorophyll's active, you're fixing sugars, you're making some of them available, and you're getting nitrogen fixation throughout the entire plant because this bug will colonize the entire plant. Moves in the uh, xylem primarily, but it can move in the, in the phloem as well. So no matter where you put it on that corn plant, whether it goes with the seed, it's gonna uh, colonize and move up. If you put it on the foliage, it's gonna move to new growth. It's gonna colonize and move down. And then on the far uh, uh, left, you've got soybeans. It, at the extreme left, that soybeans treated with a conventional inoculant. The one to the right of the measuring tape is inoculated and sprayed with Invita at the V3 stage. And what you're seeing there is a lingering effect just to demonstrate that the nitrogen fixation from the Invita got that plant off to an earlier start 
before the nodulation had kicked in. And if you trace those stems down to the end of the tailgate, you can see the nodules on both of them. So just a snapshot of how that's uh, resulted in yield in the US. So I've got their 2018, 2019 uh, results from Exotic North America, the supplier of this product. Uh, I've got their 2020 results, but they don't have them finalized until usually mid-March. So we're not, we will start showing them once we've got the final QA approved from uh, Exotic. But the foliar application on soybeans is on the left, and that is a newer registration. It's newer than their seed treatment or their in furrow applications. You can see that in 2018, they had nine trials with an 85% win rate. In 2019, they had 22 foliar trials with a 64% win rate. And then on the right-hand side, the stack graphic is a summary of their corn trials. The one at the bottom is their 2018 trials with uh, a green 50 representing 50 trials, the 11, the number of states those trials are run in, and they're marked in green. 80% the win rate, seven the bushel increment per average, two and a half the uh, ROI, two and a half X, and then above 27 trials, seven states again marked in green, an 84% win rate, and a seven and a half bushel increment. So just to wrap up with this slide, we do have limited supplies available for this year. Uh, it is a food grade product. And as such, it has no MRL or trade restrictions uh, if, as long as you're applying it to a registered crop. It's a tropical bacterium, so it will not overwinter in Canada, either in the soil, the crop or residues. So if you're working with something like a uh, winter cereal, you would apply this product in the spring, not the fall, because it's not going to make it through the winter. Uh, key benefits are we're not trying to replace nitrogen. We're trying to supplement or augment nitrogen to optimize uh, ROI and yield. And they are running a grower program, the supplier itself, and you can access the details of that grower program uh, through their website, which is listed at the bottom. So with that, I'll... Uh, throw it back to our host and try to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks, Robert. Um, this is definitely a, a different kind of product and we're excited to, uh, to carry it. I did have one question through the text line, but you kind of answered it right at the end there. Um, I had someone ask, uh, can this be used on a perennial grass and would it survive each cut or winter uh, or would it need to be reapplied? So once it's inside that plant, it won't make it through the winter in that plant, correct? No, it will not. It's uh, it's native to the tropical areas. It's isolated from sugarcane. Uh, we'll be doing some, uh, I, the forage growers just reached out to me yesterday about doing some trials as well. It does have turf registrations in other countries. They just don't have registrations on anything other than field crops on that original Canadian label. So this is used on grasses in other countries, but again, uh, the only places it would sort of relate to our conditions are Michigan, Wisconsin, and then the northern parts of Europe. Uh, our winters are going to be harsher than those, and uh, they don't overwinter. It doesn't overwinter there, so it's not going to overwinter in Manitoba. Okay, but on a yearly basis, if and when the registration comes, like for example, for an Italian ryegrass that uses a lot of N, this could be a fit, or mm -hmm. we'll stay tuned. Yeah, and you can actually do multiple applications if, if you need to. The, uh, the exotic team have been working on a field test kit. Uh, they had it out in the field the last couple of years. They're going to do some more work on refining it this year. And what it does is allows the agronomist to go into the field and measure the colonization and the effectiveness, the activity of the bacterium uh, in the plant. So you can make decisions on whether you need to come back or you need to use a, a foliar to uh, fertilizer top up so that you can read the situation of the crop. That's really so cool. Okay. We're hoping to look at that again this year and get that refined so that we'll have it available for agronomists for next year. Okay, great. Um, I just have a, a poll very similar to the first one asking about the grain corn trials. This one is for the Invita trial. So just to gauge uh, some of the uh, willingness of trials, I guess, I have a question here. So 
Paris, we do have a follow-up question on the Invita product. Yeah, I just saw it. Perfect. Yeah. So is there any residue risk if used on silage corn for animal feed? So I guess this is probably including um, any risk of, of nitrate or elevated nitrate levels in that silage. So Robert, can you speak to that? Yeah, I actually just reviewed all their uh, corn data. It's mostly from the U.S. They have one trial out of Ontario. They've been running silage trials since 2015. Uh, I just reviewed it because we've got a meeting coming up in Alberta where that, that's one of the pre-questions uh, that's been asked. Uh, they haven't seen that. What they have seen is modest increases in yield, again, related to the available nitrogen, but also a small increase or modest, but measurably statistically in crude protein and available protein. So they're going back to take a look at some more uh, quality parameters in their own field trials, because we do the large scale field trials, they do the small trials, including the quality work. Uh, they haven't seen any impact uh, as you described, but they've actually seen some benefits in overall protein. That's great. We'll look forward to more data on that. <laughs> Perfect. So I'm going to jump right into it. As Karis mentioned, my name is Kaylin. I am the territory manager on the crop protection side within Corteva. Um, so I thank everyone at Market Let Seeds for having me on today. I think there's some excellent opportunities as pioneer seed growers within the whole Corteva portfolio by um, utilizing the products on the crop protection side of things. So we're going to go through a quick update just on our grower programming, quick hitters, um, and then some new key products that I think are a great fit in Eastern Manitoba. Um, so jumping right into it, um, I do have my name and phone number, email all at the bottom of all of the slides. So if you do have any questions, follow up information or anything particular to your farm, um, please feel free to reach out. I'm available to answer any questions. I would also urge everybody, if you're available, to uh, download our field guide app. Um, so the picture on the app sites are going to show this man in a field. Um, it has information on all of our rebates as well as all of our products to some really helpful tools. So great resource to have. So jumping right into the Flex Rewards Grower offer, this is very similar to what we had last season. So providing the customers with the flexibility to choose products that are a great fit on your farm. If you're not locked into individual products, you can wait until the season comes and see what's gonna be the best fit. And also to reward loyal seed customers with enhanced rebates on our crop protection uh, products. So just looking on the right-hand side here, we have a summary of the program. Like I said, just gonna go over it very quickly, just based on time. So we do have an early booking on all of our crop protection products for 3%, which is coming up on March 15th. So if you are interested in early booking, uh, there's no uh, direct link back to the product. If you book and don't end up buying, there's no penalty. So it's a really great early incentive um, on those products. You can talk to your retail. They should all be very well versed on how to enter you on that early book program as well as the early take is on April 30th. So that, that's if there's a product you know you wanna use and you're willing to pay for it and pick it up by the end of April, you'll get an additional 2% on that product. Moving on into the bulk of the program, we have three different tiers, a core tier, which is your seed purchases as well as your crop protection purchases, minimum of $5,000 all the way up to $25,000. Our middle tier of core plus goes off of $25,000 up to $100,000 or 300 acres of seed. So this is where your seed purchases are really gonna help bump you up into a higher tier. It can be a mix of any crop. It doesn't have to be one specific, all soybeans, all corn can be a mixture. And then our top tier is over $100,000 or 800 acres of seed. As you move to the right, you can see we have our categories. So the more categories you purchase from, the higher that percent rebate is going to be. Um, seed also counts as a category. So this, as soon as you purchase one crop protection product, uh, you're gonna be starting to earn rebates on the Corteva program. Moving down into that 1% seed booster bonus. So if you have a minimum of 300 acres of seed, you're gonna qualify for an additional 1%. At the bottom there, I know it's in pretty small fine print there, but we do have a Lumavia CPL bonus. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard about Lumavia on your corn. So it's the same active available for use in cereals, peas, and lentils. 
So if you possibly struggled with cutworms, wireworms, anything like that last season, I know there were some pretty heavy pockets of insect damage across the east. Uh, if you already use that product in some of your other crops and match it to your cereal herbicides on the grass and broadleaf side of things, you'll earn an additional 30% back on that Luma Via. So it's a huge incentive. Um, so if you are struggling with insect pressure, um, I would definitely make sure to, to look into that product a little bit more. So I don't believe I mentioned as well, these rebates are going to be off the crop protection price, not on seed purchases. Just a quick overview on the product categories that we have. So we have quite a few products with Corteva. So not going to talk about all of them today. Um, it'd be a lot to cover, but pre-seed grass broadly cross spectrum is what I'm going to target today just because it is a great option to maximize that program. Fungicide, canola and corn herbicides, as well as seed as a bonus. Sorry, Kaylin, I just had a poll. Like, should we put that up now? It's, it's before you get into crop specific yes. stuff. Yep. Perfect. I think that's perfect. Perfect. So yeah, in terms of the uh, program itself, having that extra seed, pioneer seed component yes. as a booster is something that we, uh, it is going to be valuable. Yeah. For sure. And then as you can see on the right hand side here, these foundation tier builders will help go towards your total dollar value purchases to increase that tier level. Um, but those products themselves are not rebated. We do have a brand new product that launched last season called Prospect. This is a canola pre-seed product. The reason I wanted to touch on it today is just based on the conditions we've had. Our fall last year was extremely dry. We haven't had a ton of moisture um, in snowfall this past winter. So go, likely going into a pretty dry springtime. So tillage, our typical tillage practices in the spring might not be our best fit just to ensure we're trying to retain as much moisture in that soil as possible. So by doing a pre-seed herbicide option, it's a great way to control some of those overwinter, overwintered weeds and just start your crop off for a great um, start. So here I have a photo that I had uh, last season, which was a field that had a lot of volunteer alfalfa coming through. So we have our untreated on the left here. And then seven days after application, we had the prospect. It was also mixed with a half liter of glyphosate, um, but excellent results on that alfalfa. We did follow up in season with an application of Lontrell. However, it was, the grower was extremely happy with it. You are completely open for your crop rotation the following year with prospect. So it's not gonna have any residual impacts on your rotation. Couple photos here just on uh, some key driver weeds. So we have uh, cleavers on the left and hemp nettle on the right compared to a competitor product, which is Conquer and then glyphosate alone. So 40 days after application, you can see that prospect did an excellent job not seeing any regrowth from that weed um, from that growing point. So really great to, to control some of those early weeds that we see in the springtime. So Volunteer canola is a big one, all herbicide tolerant varieties, as well as dandelions is another one we tend to see quite a bit in the springtime uh, in Eastern Manitoba. Tank mix with half a liter of glyphosate is what we would recommend for that one. Moving on into the cross-spectrum portfolio, as I mentioned, our cross-spectrum products count as two categories. So it's an easy way to really maximize that grower program. Rexate has been around for a few years now and has had really great results. It is a group two grass, so simplicity, if you're familiar with that, as well as the Arlex active group four and then 2,4-D. So we are registered between two leaf all the way up to flag leaf, um, has a wide, wide range of weeds that we're targeting there. I would say would be a great fit if maybe you're struggling with some group one resistant wild oats. I would recommend Rexade. The crop staging is also a little earlier than we typically recommend with 2,4-D, so there is an extra safener that is available um, in, in the case um, that provides that extra flexibility at your timing. Nothing is needed. Um, it has everything in the case. You don't need to add any surfactants at all to this product. Again, all crops for your rotation the following year. Moving on into Resivant, this is another newer product that we launched uh, a couple years ago. So this one I would say is a great fit on the flip side if you're maybe dealing with some group two resistance. So this has a group one grass control product along with Fluoroxapir and Arlex. So great for kochia is another driver weed for Resivant as well as all of our common, common weeds that we typically deal with year after year. 
And a big driver weed I know in Eastern Manitoba is field horsetail. So this is a photo of field horsetail controlled with Resovant. Um, it's definitely a difficult one. Um, if you've struggled with it on your farm, it typically comes back every single year, heavier pressure every year. So uh, the Arlex Active is great in controlling that, that weed specifically. It looks like a little pine tree almost when they are green and healthy and growing. So we do recommend a tank mix of MCPA with this product just to round out that weed control. Moving on just into a quick update on a new broadleaf herbicide that we are launching this year. So we just got registration on this product a couple weeks ago. Uh, it's a Just Go Arlex. So again, focusing on that group four herbicide with fluoroxapyr and Lontrell. So this one I would say is a great fit if you have some perennial broadleaf weed concerns, any thistles, dandelion, Prominex is gonna be able to control it. I would put this field in, or this product in a field maybe that you're struggling with some tough to control weeds. It's really a strong, a strong fit. Um, we do recommend a tank mix of MCP as well and available to mix with any grass herbicide that you choose. Our rotation for anything with Lontrell based products is a little bit limited, just if you're wanting to go into peas or soybeans the next year. So we do recommend a minimum of five and a half inches of rain between your application and the end of August, just to ensure that that product breaks down and does not cause any concerns in your crop the following year. So something to keep in mind if you are planning to go into beans your following year. A couple of the key weeds um, are listed up on the slide here. So a lot more versus what's just on here um, on the slide, a lot more on the label. We have curl dock on the top, only seven days after application, very, very quick acting, and then a dandelion that was quite large in size, but you can barely even make out the, the leaves there. It was crisped up pretty good. So excellent control on those perennial weeds for sure. I didn't want to forget about oats. So our Arlex products are limited for um, application on wheat and barley. Stellar has been a great product. It is the number one broadleaf herbicide in oats across Western Canada. So a great tool uh, if you're looking to control your broadleafs in your, your oat crops. And sticking on the oat side of things, we did launch Serafit, which is a new foliar fungicide last season. It has a group 11 as well as a group three. So going to provide broad spectrum control on our leaf diseases. I would say our biggest target crop in this product is going to be oats. Um, targeting that early flag leaf when it's about an inch to an inch and a half poking out is when we're going to get the best results with Serafit. So if you're struggling with rust, uh, net blotch, powdery mildew, any of those cereal leaf disease products is going to be a great fit for Serafit. You can see the photo here, the treated on the left versus the untreated on the right. So very visual differences there uh, when comparing those two. And finally, on the corn side of things, I did want to make note about Lontrell XC. So last year we did get registration to spray Lontrell as well as Eclipse in corn up to the V6 stage. So this is a great option if you're struggling with, again, dandelions, thistles, perennial weed pressure to add that Lontrell in either with your glyphosate or utilize Eclipse XC, which has our VP480 glyphosate co-packed with Lontrell in a 40 acre case. Um, so this one, again, I wanted to just, just make note of quickly. Um, it is also registered in conventional cord with the Lontrell on its own as well too. So I know that corn is, is definitely a big, a big crop in the area. So we do have other options in Sorten and Steadfast, but didn't want to get into it all today. Like I said, my phone number is at the bottom, um, as well as my email. So if you have any questions on that, definitely feel free to reach out, uh, to myself. I know we went through that really, really quickly, but uh, just in the essence of time, didn't want to keep anybody uh, too long over the hour. Um, so yeah, that was what we had on the crop protection portfolio. And I appreciate everybody on the call today. And like I said, any questions, definitely reach out to me. Great. Thanks, Kaylin. Uh, yeah, that Lontrell, the last one, I think is a good fit. A, like you mentioned, for our conventional corn growers. There's not mm. many, but uh, there's, yeah. always, there's always an, uh, a question there about how to best control the weeds. And then B, like we have a big alfalfa corn rotation here, and that calls for a lot of dandelions. So this is going to be this is going to be a good fit, I think, to get rid of a lot of those perennials. Okay, for sure. And Lontrell is also excellent in controlling volunteer alfalfa as well. 
yeah okay perfect yes, <laughs> um, good point it always grows when you don't want it to grow <laughs> exactly yeah okay we're going to take a couple of minutes here first of all thank you to all our wonderful speakers we are going to draw the prizes we did go past 10 o'clock but not much uh <laughs> we're going to draw the prizes we have basically seven winners one of them is the grand prize for the barbecue so i have the list here then yeah, so we used uh, the best agronomist in town, Mr. Google here, to draw some random numbers. And we have six um, spring prize packs for kind of the pickup days replacement, which I know isn't the same as we, we like to do it with having people at the office. Um, but all of these winners will have uh, a prize pack dropped off with their seed this spring. So we have Ed Dirksen, we have Emil Morin, we have Paul Lepke, we have Phil who might have to let us know which, which Phil it is uh, to get your prize pack because we're not quite sure on that one yet. Uh, then we have Rob Crow and Ryan, which uh, also I think maybe give us a heads up just to make sure that um, we, we have the right, the right Ryan in the room for the prize. And then our grand prize, the barbecue here is uh, finding a great new home at Tom Leppelman's. There so. you go, congrats guys. Uh, do have any questions here? There will be a short survey after the meeting is over that pops up. Uh, we can follow up with anything. But thank you very much to our panelists today. Thank you to all of our attendees for coming. Great crowd. Um, we really enjoyed these, these virtual meetings. We had two, and I think two is uh, enough <laughs> for one year <laughs> or for one winter, I should say. We'll see how the crop, how the crop tours are going to go this fall. But um, Again, thank you very much for joining and I'm going to end the meeting just in a few seconds here.